I've heard that uh, one of the first domesticated animals that, that man uh, worked with was the chicken, the fowl, the jungle fowl. And we domesticated them because they were easy to care for. They were small, but they did provide a food source. And I think that's something that, that we have held on to was that uh, relationship that we had with the chicken, you know, uh, and we even brought it into cities that we built. I just grew up on a little hobby farm, and most teenage girls are not interested in chickens, but I was. <laughs> they were my pets. I actually read a thing on the internet the other day, and they described them as pets with benefits, because they're, they're just like a dog. They follow you around and hang out, except they lay eggs for you. Beautiful, nice, rich eggs. I mean, what's there not to like about it, right? And more and more people down here getting into it. I think it's great. And the great thing about eggs, eggs come in a perfect package, the shell. A fresh egg, there's no comparison. It's like, it's like describing apples and oranges. The yolk is not, it's not watery. It's almost like a gel. It's a deeper yellow. They stand up better to frying. They don't sort of flatten out in the, in the frying pan. They're just more delicious. We cleared all of our insects out of the backyard. They helped us manage weeds. They produced the eggs for the neighborhood. They fertilized my garden, which produced a bounty of produce that also fed my neighbors. So to me, it's just the next step. This is the little fertilizer machine for your garden. We can give chickens our food waste. It may be waste to us, but it's food to the chickens, you know, uh, and that will keep landfills from overgrowing. I didn't realize how fun they were, how smart they were, and how much each individual chicken has its own personality. Most people also develop relationships with their birds where they actually appreciate them. They have names. She was very sweet. Her, she was named after Cordelia and King Lear. The preschoolers named them Skittles, Tootsie Roll, and Donut. The Bantam one is Lily Hammer, and the other one is Miss Downy Pantaloons, for obvious reasons. She's got Downy Pantaloons. <laughs> I believe chickens are part of the ecosystem that we live in within a city to help us improve our lifestyle. I'm not really into politics that much. I don't really know what, what's, what the deciding factors are. Whether if we all kind of stood up and said, here we are, this is what we're doing, chickens, whether they'd be like, oh great, <laughs> fine, 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 or whether it would be like, okay, all of these people have chickens and there's no issue. I don't know. I guess that's something maybe we could talk about and decide. It appeared to be illegal to raise chickens in the city, yet I was going to do it anyway. I had accumulated a $70,000 fine, and I was not concerned. It was a crack house for 10 years, and for 10 years, that backyard was filled with garbage, and the city did nothing about it. And the optics of fining me $70,000 after I turned it into an urban farm, when they did nothing about crack, yet they were gonna crack down on a bunch of chickens, they would look so stupid. Because there was an antiquated bylaw or a rule, and most bureaucrats are rule followers. And if it is written in black and white, it is so. In the rural areas, oh, not, it's not even worth having the conversation. Like, just, just stop, go home, have a drink, let them have their freaking chickens. Like, oh, God. It's just a small fishing village. Raising your own animals and doing your own thing, it's just a simple place, small place. Everybody knows everybody. Chickens are it's way of life down here and always has been. I just, I don't see it stopping in my mind. I had to get rid of them because I can't keep, uh, you know, the fines are just going to be too much, I imagine, after a while. 
So there's there's you know there's chickens in Portuguese Cove, chickens in Catch Harbor, the next village over, chickens in Zambra and farms. There's people that have goats and horses and whatnot. Um, not very far away, so you know. But uh, yeah, maybe I just have too much road access. I guess yeah. Yeah. People can see what I'm doing. <laughs> uh. Well, <laughs> we eat a lot of eggs, of course. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, work's hard, work's getting harder to come by these days. Uh, just, you know, it's not getting any better really that way. Uh, so you know, there's times where we, uh, the chickens have come in quite handy with the family. You know, there's there's uh, different things that that affects, like losing my chickens. You know, um, they help me do my gardening. They condition the soil that I grow a lot of my food in that I, you know, that I preserve for the winter to make it through the hardest time of the year, basically, for me. So, you know, that losing all that, that's, you know, that hurts. So, growing your food should be, you know, one of the main things. I mean, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Like, that's, that's reality, right? As far as not allowing them, I mean, that was, I think, more of our uh, artifact of the times. Um, when you look at that sort of rural-urban transition, uh, there's, a, I think, a sense that when you're in a rural environment, that's the farms, and then when we have this that isn't a rural, you know, there's a definite line saying, well, no, we're not going to have livestock in town, you know. Um, like I say, this, we're in kind of a different context now. You know, time, times have changed. Quite often people have chickens and the reason we don't have a lot of complaints is there's not a lot to complain about. Um, so that, that's the reality. I think um, perception is, is that these things are loud and noisy and you have all sorts of smells and all sorts of things and that can happen in instances and that would probably generate complaints and we'd probably get involved. You know, where it doesn't, um, by and large I think the benefits outweigh the, uh, the challenges, especially if your neighbors get a few eggs. It's uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, a lot of communities have seen their way clear to, to explicitly permit them. Um, but in our case, it's not been as big an issue. Why can't we look at the municipality who does it the best and want to be like them? I have a business in New York City. Not only is there no uh, prohibition, it is encouraged. New York City is a big chaotic city that they have been able to figure out where their priorities are and that is investing in communities where food security and sustainability is a big issue. I belong to an organization in New York called Just Food, which places sustainable food and community gardens in all underserved areas in New York, as well as running a chicken coop program. Every March, they host a two-day food conference at Columbia University. is the one thing that really connects people together. Everyone loves food and it helped bring us together and give us somewhere to start working together. If we can share bread together, that means we can also work on uh, issues that are affecting us you know, to improve everyone's life. So when I first moved here in, in the 80s, in the late 80s, uh, I lived in uh, the Bronx, uh, and there was chickens all over. You know, people were keeping chickens in their backyards, keeping them in community gardens. You know, uh, it was just part of the culture of, of, of uh, a lot of communities. You know, so we're, I think we're lucky in, in that way that the city uh, has always allowed us to keep chickens and rabbits. As long as you're keeping chickens for your personal use, uh, you can keep as many chickens as you can keep clean. We cannot keep roosters 
because of the noise, you know. But that's okay because we use chickens for their eggs and a, a hen does not need a rooster in order to lay an egg. They're like, oh, are they gonna have chicks? Are they laying eggs? And yeah, they're laying eggs. Are they gonna have chicks? No, we don't have a rooster. What? None of the, they're only girls and yeah, they're just girls. So they don't lay chicks. Like well, you have to go through the whole process where it's like, since we don't have a rooster, I mean, I have these conversations with adults numerous times and the kids have to be reminded. So I think it's a learning process for everyone, so. Kendra, she's part of uh, a public school, uh, PS 154 in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, uh, which is an area where uh, ch chickens have always been. So pre-K through five, it's been great for the kids in the community. I remember when we first talked about getting chickens and a first grader, um, I think I said something about, well, we'll harvest their eggs and, you know, give them to volunteers and eat them. And I hear this, ew. And I was like, what? He's like, eggs come from chickens? And I was like, well, look, we're learning already. <laughs> During the school year, garden clubs mainly involved with like visiting the chickens, checking on the chickens, maintaining the garden, learning about the garden. It's educating them about how to eat healthy. I mean, we don't grow enough food at our garden to really feed our students, but we give them the opportunity to try something new where they can make a better choice about their food. If they know where their food's coming from and also if it's local or how they can do it themselves, that may impact the future. Like, I feel like we're focusing on creating memories and learning experiences that will be lasting into their life. It's been a real community building experience from the fact that we have, you know, volunteers who get up and, you know, bring fresh water and, you know, bring their food scraps to the chickens and then giving the eggs to the woman who's providing us with power. And then, you know, we have a guy who works in a grocery store and he, you know, whenever I text him, I said, you have food for the chickens? And, you know, he gives me 20 pounds of food that, of, you know, lettuce and cabbage, just the outside of things that would have gone into a landfill. And then I give him eggs and then we have, schools coming and now we have uh, one of our volunteers her third and fourth graders are now the Tuesday morning shift at the coop and they're taking care of the chickens there's an alternative to incarceration program so youth or children who've been incarcerated instead of being incarcerated are working in the garden um, with some leadership and they help take care of the chickens as well um, and it's been very positive you know, one day I remember I went, I went to the garden in the morning and uh, there was a kid there waiting to get into the park. And it was a little early and he said, uh, I just, I just want to see the chickens before I go to school. And so I took him in and he just wanted to hang out with him for a few minutes. So I think it brings a lot of um, kind of, there's curiosity, there's peacefulness, there's the noise. Um, so there's, there are many sort of facets of, of the group. It's not just eggs or just for, you know, compost. There's sort of more to it than I had even thought there would be. Um, our chickens are beloved as, uh, and we really love to have them as educators. It's what we call the, the gateway drug into composting. I don't know if anybody's told you that. <laughs> See, these chickens eat pretty good. They do. With these food scraps. These are all our nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen, the wood chips are uh, carbons, so that helps a lot with the um, the pests and the, the food moisture. Look at the chickens, look.
York City could serve as an example of how to integrate uh, agriculture into a city, and that includes chickens. You know, uh, so that way, you know, you can have a complete meal, you know, that was grown right here in your own city. And I think that improves everyone's life, you know. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Oh, just looking forward to the day where I can have chickens again. <laughs> yep. I miss them. Big time. And my garden will too. <laughs>